to say that it's really an honor that Melanie's here. And Melanie, I've, I've told her this story, but I remember vividly it was 1989. That was my first year at Oxford. And I remember that Melanie wrote an article about anti-Semitism, and she said in the article something to the effect, I don't remember the exact quote, but if you speak about racism in the United, Sta in, in the United Kingdom and um, issues of class, class issues, you could have great dinner conversation, and it's very acceptable. Nothing will be done, but it's great conversation. And the moment you speak about anti-Semitism, people would look at their shoes and there'd be silence. And Melanie was really, really at the forefront of dealing with the sort of the politically correct anti-Semitism and the silence on radical political Islam uh, that the West has, uh, has been doing. Unfortunately, Europe is apparently beginning to wake up. We'll hear more how much they are waking up. But it's also interesting how just uh, Friday, I believe it was, that uh, Holland and uh, Obama, the two administrations, the delegations were meeting and the press were there and Holland mentioned radical political Islam and terrorism and the White House actually censored Holland. Yeah. And when the media caught up, caught on to it, the White House had to reissue the transcript and the video. But imagine in 2016, after all the attacks in the United States, in Europe, Estimates are 500,000 dead people in Syria, 12 million refugees destabilizing or threatening to destabilize European security, if not society and the, the, the economy. And the administration is still silent, and it's politically incorrect to even utter these words in 2016. It's absurd and dangerous. So on that note, I'm happy that Melanie's here, and, I'm, and Vivaldi will take over. Okay. So welcome, sir, this evening. I have the very paradoxical duty of introducing somebody who doesn't need to be introduced. Uh, my name is Vivaldi Jean-Marie, and I am honored to introduce Melanie Phillips, who is a British journalist, a broadcaster, and author. Her weekly column, which currently appears in The Times, has been published over the years in The Guardian, Observer, The Sunday Times, The Daily Mail. She writes regularly for The Jewish Chronicle and The Jerusalem Post. She is also a regular panelist on BBC Radio's The Mo Maze, and she speaks on public platforms throughout the English-speaking world. Also, The Asset of Woman, her study of the ideas behind the female suffrage was published in 2003 by Little Brown. Her best-selling book, Lon Lond Londoniston, about the British establishment's capitulation to Islamist aggression, um, aggression was published in 2006 by Encounter, New York, which she followed in 2010 with the world turned upside down, the global battle over God, truth, and power, with a foreword by David Mamet and also published by Encounter. So let's look forward to a very stimulating presentation and welcome Melanie Phillips to ISGAP. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for providing weather to make me feel completely at home. Um, so um, my topic this evening is quite a specific one, but um, Obviously, it touches on a number of other related issues, and I'm sure we will cover those issues um, in discussion after my remarks. But um, my remarks are specifically about uh, Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, a dangerous comparison. And um, Charles stole my first line, so thank you, Charles, um, very much, uh, because I was going to say that the time was when anti-Semitism in Britain was... Uh, the uh, prejudice that dare not speak its name. Um, you could talk about all kinds of other prejudices, but as soon as you mention the word anti-Semitism, as Charles said, people started looking at their shoes. It was considered very uh, infradig, and the reasons for that are important, and I will come on to those in a moment. But nevertheless, that was the case. Um, it was a taboo word, and I couldn't use it. 
uh, without fear of even worse consequences for myself in terms of my professional reputation happening than were already occurring. Um, and so imagine my amazement when, um, as of uh, very recently, I would say in the last few weeks, the word anti-Semitism has been bandied around uh, in British newspapers. Imagine my shock. I would never have believed it possible to have seen this word uh, being uh, reproduced without, you know, a health warning or a, a trigger alert, I think you call them in this country. Um, there has been an absolute outbreak of real concern about outbreaks of anti-Semitism, so-called, among Labour Party members of Parliament. Now, you may be aware that the Labour Party in Britain has, um, a year or so ago, elected a, as leader a man called Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who is on the extreme left and who is known to have shared platforms and found nothing wrong in people from, the Hem from Hamas and the Hezbollah and stuff like that. And people who have made uh, very uh, 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 bigoted remarks about Jews without even bothering to um, count, couch it in terms of uh, uh, Israel. And uh, there are uh, uh, many... Uh, members of parliament, Labour members of parliament, who are very concerned about this. It's come as a terrible shock to them that a number of these uh, members of parliament have been caught out and it's being reported of what they have said. In addition, um, the chairman of the Oxford University Labour Club, not a Jew, uh, resigned in protest at what he said was totally dreadful attitudes against Jews in the Oxford University Labour Club, which is affiliated to the Labour Party, and uh, more generally on the left in Oxford. And he said it's anti-Jew um, and it's connected to Israel. And the balloon went up. For the first time, it was being reported that there was concern about anti-Semitism on campus, not anti-Israelism, anti-Semitism. And this produced a number of reactions um, which were in some ways heartening and in some ways disheartening and indeed quite comical because a number of Labour members of Parliament and a number of commentators said, uh, made speeches and wrote articles saying this is appalling. Where has this come from? What a surprise. Not to me, but anyway, what a surprise to them. They couldn't understand where it had come from because prejudice against Jews is, you know, not on. And it's connected to Israel. Imagine my amazement. They are connecting prejudice against Jews with prejudice against Israel. My goodness me. <laughs> However, Joy was not unconfined because a number of these people went on to say, we have to stamp this out. We cannot have a Labour Party which is tolerating this kind of bigotry. It is bigotry. It has to be exterminated and etc. Fine. They then went on to say, but that doesn't mean we should stop saying that Israel is a vicious, dreadful state and it oppresses the Palestinians and it's the cause of war in the Middle East and Benjamin Netanyahu is a war criminal without understanding that if you tell lies about Israel, then uh, it's uh, a form of Jew hatred and leads inescapably, in my view, to Jew hatred that doesn't even shelter behind the anti-Israel thing. So they don't get it. But nevertheless, it's on the agenda. And the other thing that some of these commentators have been saying, and, 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 and politicians, is we have to defeat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. In other words, there is an equation. Yes, we are very concerned about prejudice against Jews, but we are equal opportunity anti-discriminators. And we must balance that concern for eradicating prejudice against Jews with our equal concern for the equal evil of Islamophobia or prejudice against Muslims. So, in my view, this equation, this equality, this identicality uh, is very wrong. This idea these are twin evils to be defeated, uh, that Jews and Muslims equally have to be defended, that there is an equality or an identicality of victimhood on both sides. Now, I think this is very wrong on many counts. And in order to get into why it's wrong, um, I think we have to understand 
why anti-Semitism, the word anti-Semitism, was unsayable in Britain for so long. Um, the cardinal premise of progressive opinion in Britain is what's called equality. But by that, what is meant is really what I would call identicality. That is to say, you have an absolute belief that there is an absolute equality in terms, or identicality in terms of uh, lifestyle, culture, and victimhood. So you can't say that one culture is better than any other, uh, regardless of what people are doing. You can't say that one lifestyle is better than any other, regardless of what people are doing in that lifestyle. And you can't say that anyone who claims they are a victim is anything other than that thing. They are victims, equally. And all victims are equal, and that they're all equally victims of something or another. Except for anti-Semitism. <coughs> the Jews were not victims. The Jews were not victims. Why was that? Well, partly because it was the link with Israel. Um, you say this is anti-Semitism, I say you are sanitizing uh, Israel's misdeeds by waving the shroud of the Holocaust. This was the standard response when anyone said there is a problem with the treatment of Israel. It is uniquely, uh, it, it, it is a, a, a unique treatment uh, and it is a form of Jew hatred. The answer was um, you are waving the shroud of the Holocaust to sanitize the crimes of Israel. So Anti-Semitism was unsayable partly because of the Israel thing, but that wasn't all. I think that anti-Semitism was, I think that anti-Semitism was unsayable for two other reasons. First of all, Jews are not considered a minority. Now, this is a little bit silly, to put it mildly. There are 60 to 65 million people in Britain. There are 280,000 identifying Jews, but they're not a minority because, we, as we all know, the Jews control everything, don't they, in the West. They control finance, they control the media, they control the law, they're everywhere. So they're not a minority. Because the dominant narrative is that to be a minority or to be a victim, it's not enough to be numerically a minority. That doesn't count anymore. You have to have no power. And Jews have power. We can all see it. They have power. They run the West. They run America. They run the West. So Jews are not a minority, so they can't be victims. Because only minorities can be victims. The majority can never be victims. The minority is always the victim of the majority. So the majority can never be a victim. So I have to tell you, uh, apropos of 9-11, when 9-11 happened, a very common reaction in, America, in, in, in Britain was America had it coming to it. It couldn't be a victim. Could not be a victim because, we, as we all know, America runs the world, grinds the faces of the third world into the dust, and consequently America couldn't be a victim. <coughs> That's how it was seen. So Jews can't be victims. And then there was a final reason why anti-Semitism uh, was not considered to be a kind of victimhood. Um, uh, which is my theory. It's not just my theory, but it's not possible to prove it, but I feel it uh, to be the case. I would call it Holocaust revenge. As you know, it's a bit of a joke. Some people use it as a joke, but it's my view it's not a joke. It's absolutely correct. The Jews will never stop being blamed for the Holocaust because to the Europeans, um, they can't deal with their uh, complicity in what happened. And I'm not just talking about the Germans, I'm talking about the Europeans generally turning a blind eye, etc., etc. Um, uh, they can't deal with this. The enormity of the crime to which they were at least partly responsible um, is such that they can't bear the idea anymore that Jews can be victims. Jews can never again be considered victims because that brings up their complicity in when they were victims of the Holocaust. So in order to kind of mask that or, or, or get over the pain of that, Jews can't be victims, then, then they're free of that guilt. In, and, and so it's very convenient that Jews have become in Britain or became, uh, certainly with Ariel Sharon, I remember this happening in 1982 when 
Israel was having its uh, very controversial adventure in Lebanon, uh, and there was the massacre at Sabra and Shatila, you will rec may recall, uh, conducted by the uh, Christian phalangists, but with Israel apparently uh, giving a nod and a wink, at least that was what was thought to have happened. So Britain was thrilled. Britain now had a Jewish Nazi. And that gave Britain and Europe the get out from the Holocaust, because if the Jews were turning into Nazis, then the Nazis weren't really that bad, because the Jews were doing the same kind of thing, and therefore, their own complicity, Europe, Britain, the West, in, uh, in what happened uh, was much lessened. So that's my, my theory. Anyway, for these reasons, uh, 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 anti-Semitism was unsayable. Um, but I also think there's another reason, and this is where it links directly to the Israel, uh, the Middle East. Uh, to say that Jews are the victims of Jew hatred goes against the narrative. Now, for the liberal or left progressive position, there is one narrative, only ever one narrative, on any issue, and it cannot be gainsaid. It's an orthodoxy. Whatever it is, it's an orthodoxy, and that's it. So the narrative is that in the Middle East, the Palestinians are victims. They have to be victims. Why? They're the third world. The third world are axiomatically victims, and they are people whose own story is that they were driven out. And as far as the British are concerned, they have no idea that whether that was true or not, but they believe it on face value. And they also believe on face value the idea that the Palestinian Muslims were in Israel since time immemorial. Oh, yeah. That Palestine was Palestine since time immemorial, probably since Adam, and that the indigenous people of current Israel were the Palestinian Muslims, and that the European Jews, had, who had no connection whatsoever uh, with the land of Palestine, were parachuted in as a result of Holocaust guilt into Palestine, where they proceeded to displace the indigenous people, the Palestinian Muslims, into dreadful refugee camps, where they still are, brackets, refugee camps after all this time, but anyway, they don't even think about that, and where they're trying to basically make their lives complete misery until this very day. So that's the sort of prevailing narrative. The Palestinians are Muslims. So therefore, you cannot have Jewish victims. The, the, the Palestinians are victims. You cannot have Jewish victims. You cannot have Israelis who are victims because the Israelis are the people who are victimizing the Palestinians. So when the rockets come from Gaza, and when, as is happening at the moment, almost every day, uh, Israelis are being stabbed and rocks thrown through their windshields and generally murder is being attempted and often is succeeding against them, it's not even reported. It's not even reported in Britain. No one knows this is going on, no one. Because they're not victims, they can't be victims. You cannot have the victims who are the people who are oppressing the victims. It does their head in. So the Jews are not victims. So because the Jews cannot be victims, and because the Palestinians cannot be victimizers, and because Muslims can't be, vi can't be victimizers, because Muslims are a minority and they are the victims of the Christian West. Therefore, Palestinian and Muslim anti-Semitism is just denied. No one knows about it, no one writes about it, no one talks about it. And if you were to mention it, you would get accused of Islamophobia. So this is quite remarkable because Palestinian violence against Israel is being driven at the moment by classic, clear, religious Jew hatred. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas says, get off the Temple Mount with your filthy feet, not reported in Britain, but that's what people are being told. That's what the, the P Palestinians are telling their children. They are telling their children Al-Aqsa is being, is being attacked. Um, and this is all part of the Jewish conspiracy to destroy Islam. We're under attack by the Jews. We must kill, you must kill Jews. Your highest calling is to kill Jews. None of this is reported at all in Britain. Um, and it's very, very clear. Um, I mean, there are innumerable examples. Uh, I get many of them from Palestinian Media Watch, uh, which is an excellent uh, resource. I do commend it to you. Um, uh, for example, um, a Palestinian authority TV host of a program 
uh, teaching Islam, explained in a recent TV interview that the US and Israel share the goal of destroying the morals and values of the Arab world and are trying to do this by spreading pornography and sex. That's just one of many, many examples. According to Palestinian Media Watch, the Palestinian Authority, that well-known source of moderation and statesmanship, which Britain and Europe hope will eventually become a Palestinian state because it's worthy of being given its own state. The Palestinian Authority presents Jews as possessing inherently evil traits. Jews are said to be treacherous, corrupt, allied with the devil, descendants of apes and pigs. In 2015, PA, uh, the, the uh, Mehmoud Abbas's advisor on Islam and the head of the Palestinian Authority Sharia Courts uh, taught on Palestinian Authority TV that Jews throughout history have represented falsehood, evil, the devils and their supporters, the Satans and their supporters. Accordingly, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, in the view of this gentleman, was a conflict of Allah's project versus Satan's project. Amazing to report nothing about the settlements. It's Allah versus Satan, and Satan is the Jews. A more classic example of anti-Semitism, Jew hatred, cannot be imagined. The official PA Daily published an op-ed saying Jews are thirsty for blood to please their God against the Gentiles and crave pockets full of money. These Jewish attributes and traditions are presented as the unchangeable nature of Jews. The PA regularly claims that the Jews were forced out of Europe in the past because of the threat that their evil nature posed to the Europeans. These Jewish traits and ways of behavior constitute a danger, it says, not only to all Muslims and Arabs, but to all of humanity. That's the Palestinian Authority. In the wider Arab uh, 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 and Muslim world, uh, Jew hatred simply pours out and has poured out for years. And it's not even sanitized by any reference to Israel. It's Mein Kampf, it's the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, it's Jews baking uh, the blood of Gentiles and Palestinian babies in their matzahs. It's all of that. It's the same motifs, the same lies and libels, the same absurd conspiracy theories that go back centuries. Um, it's unequivocal Jew hatred. Um, and it's pouring out all the time. Now, what people do not understand at all, because this is never reported, it's never mentioned, it's never discussed, is the centrality of Muslim anti-Semitism, not just to the campaign against Israel, but to the campaign against the West. Uh, in 1998, Osama bin Laden said, the enmity between us and the Jews goes back far in time and is deep-rooted. There is no question that war between us is inevitable. The hour of resurrection shall not come before Muslims fight Jews. He's talking not just about Israel, he's talking about Jews in general. We promise our Muslim brothers that we will do the best we can to harm Jews in Israel and the world over with Allah's help and according to his command, said Al-Qaeda's number two, Amen Zawakhri, in 2008. Sheikh Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, has said, quote, if we search the entire world for a person more cowardly, despicable, weak and feeble in psyche, mind, ideology and religion, we would not find anyone like the Jew. Notice, I do not say the Israeli. That's what the leader of the Hezbollah said. Um, an Egyptian cleric, Muhammad Hussein Yaqub, said on Al Rahma TV in January 2009, the real reason for the Muslim war against the Jews was nothing to do with Israel. Quote, if the Jews left Palestine to us, would we start loving them? Of course not. We will never love them. Absolutely not. The Jews are infidels, not because I say so, and not because they are killing Muslims. It is Allah who said that they are infidels. Your belief regarding the Jews should be first that they are infidels and second that they are enemies. They are enemies not because they occupied Palestine. They would have been enemies even if they did not occupy a thing. Now, there are innumerable references in the Quran and the Hadith to uh, the enmity uh, of Islam against the Jews. Um, I won't bore you with all the references, but there are many of them. Now, the point is this, that 
um, uh, it's not simply the Jews as Jews, and it's not simply the Jews of Israel. It's the idea that the Jews stand behind the West. The Jews stand behind modernity. The fight that Islam has with the West is a defensive fight, actually. It's a defensive fight against modernity, which it perceives correctly um, is about to destroy Islam. Uh, in large measure, I think, because of the appeal of, uh, to women of modernity. But anyway, um, it sees modernity as the threat, and the Jews are behind modernity. Um, you can see that from the Hamas Charter, uh, which, apart from uh, its stuff about getting rid of Israel, um, quite comically, if it wasn't so awful, uh, says the Jews are behind the whole of modernity, from the French Revolution onwards. They were behind the French Revolution, they were behind the Industrial Revolution, they were behind the development of sociology, they were behind the development of capitalism, they were behind the, behind the development of communism, they were behind the League of Nations, they are behind the First World War. On and on it goes. Every aspect of the modern world is put down to the Jews, because the Jews control America, America controls modernity. And the, this was also found uh, within the... Um, the writings and thinking uh, of the, the man who could, well, one of the few men who can legitimately be called the founders of modern Islamism, um, Said Qutub. He founded what became the Muslim Brotherhood, an Egyptian uh, uh, cleric. And he wrote a diatribe in 1950 called Our Struggle with the Jews. And he declared that the Jews were the adversary of God, quote, the Jews were the enemies of the Muslim community from the first day. He said, the Jews were conspiring to penetrate governments all over the world to perpetuate their evil designs, including a plan to take control of all the wealth of mankind. One of the tricks they were playing on the world was the development of philosophy, whose purpose was to eliminate all limitations imposed by faith and religion so the Jews could penetrate the body politic of the entire world. At the top of the list of these activities was usury, the aim of which was that the wealth of the whole of mankind should end up in the hands of Jewish financial institutions. Now, he's the leader of the, he was the leader, he was the, the inspiration of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, radical Islamists follow what he said and thought that this is mainstream radical Muslim thinking. Now, the writer Matthias Kunsel has noted that to Kutub, not only was everything Jewish evil, but everything evil was Jewish, particularly sensuality. So uh, Kutub wrote, uh, uh, alluding to Marx, Freud, and Emil Durkheim, Kutub wrote, behind the doctrine of atheistic materialism was a Jew, behind the doctrine of animalistic sexuality was a Jew, and behind the destruction of the family and the shattering of the sacred relationship in society was a Jew. They free the sensual desires from their restraints. They destroy the moral foundation on which the pure creed rests in order that the creed should fall into the filth which they spread so widely on this earth. And it's stuff like that which is behind the Hamas covenant. It's not simply the, what Hamas thinks. This, this drives the Muslim world, that the Jews are behind modernity, the spreading of evil in the world, uh, which is spread by America in particular because America controls capitalism, modernity, runs the world. So America is the principal target, but the people who run America are the real target. And for all these and other reasons, you will have noticed that in these terrible atrocities that happen so regularly uh, in Europe, for sure it's against a lot of people it's against infidels generally. Um, but within those atrocities, there's always a particular targeting uh, of Jewish institutions of, and of Jews, because Jews have a central place in this demonology uh, against the Western world in general. Now, none of this, absolutely none of this, is known, I think, to more than a handful of people in Britain who are all you know, obsessive like me and driven by a particular, you know, noxious ideology. Um, uh, it's never mentioned. It's never reported. Nobody has a clue that Muslims generally think like this. Um, so, and in fact, there have been people who've actually blurted out this truth within the Muslim community in Britain. There's one particularly, um, with one particular individual um, who uh, is... Uh, he's, he, has, uh, he tries to conceal his radical sympathies 
um, and who said once, it's our dirty little secret that Jew hatred is absolutely omnipresent in the British Muslim community. Now, this was not reported. I mean, I read it, but it was only reported you know, you know, on a blog, on a blog, or picked up by by particular people, but it wasn't widely reported. It's simply not noticed. Nobody has a clue about any of this. Not only is it ignored, but you have, instead of the discussion of Muslim anti-Semitism, you have instead the discussion of Islamophobia. Islamophobia is the is the 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 problem the social problem, the evil of bigotry that we all must address. Um, now, there is absolutely no doubt that prejudice or bigotry against anybody is wrong. And there is no doubt, I'm sure, that there are people who really dislike Muslims. Um, they dislike people with brown or black faces. They dislike people of all kinds because there are people who are bigots. Um, but the uh, claim of Islamophobia um, has a characteristic which is simply not acknowledged. Um, the difference between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism is the difference between truth and lies. Anti-Semitism is a true prejudice because anti-Semitism rests entirely upon lies and libels about the Jewish, about the Jewish people. So whatever, 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 whatever form these lies and libels take, they are untrue. Islamophobia, on the other hand, is a false prejudice uh, designed to shut down the telling of truths about Muslims or Islam. Because if you tell the truth that there is a problem within the Islamic world, there is a problem within Muslim culture to do with extremism, there, is, there are problems to do with Islamic, uh, I, uh, uh, Islamic theology and history uh, with which Muslims themselves have to deal. Any kind of criticism of Islam or Muslims which is based on evidence and fact and truth is said to be Islamophobic. Any criticism is said to be Islamophobic because no criticism can be tolerated of Islam or Muslims. So. Islamophobia is the accusation which shuts down legitimate debate, not just about uh, Muslim anti-Semitism, but about all the problems to do with the Islamic world, uh, which we need to know and we need to discuss, and the Islamic world needs to discuss them as well and do something about them. But we're not allowed to say that because if you're saying it, you are considered to be and said to be Islamophobic. And this is a dead in Britain. This is a I don't know about in America, but in Britain, this is a deadly uh, accusation. It's equivalent to racism. It's equivalent to anti-Semitism. It means you are a really bad person. You are a bigot. You are prejudiced. But you cannot be, in my view, prejudiced or bigoted if you're telling the truth. And it's this inability to understand or acknowledge the difference between truth and lies, which is really poisoning public debate. Um, about these matters, and I would say also about Israel. Equating Islamophobia and anti-Semitism strengthens the weapon of Islamophobia and weakens the fight against anti-Semitism. But I also think it doesn't just, this doesn't just hurt Jews, it damages the defense of the West for the reasons <coughs> I have already alluded to, that Muslim anti-Semitism drives the hatred of the West and the desire to bring it down. Jihadists are motivated in large measure by Jew hatred. They're motivated by hatred of the infidel. Generally, it's true. They have uh, bad designs against Christians and people of no religion. That's true. But the, what drives them, what gives them the hysteria, the obsessional hysteria, is the Jew hatred because Jew hatred is behind their hatred of modernity. But in Britain and Europe, and I think here as well, people are just not joining up the dots. They try to deny the Islamist nature of, Islam, of his Islamist terror by finding any reason to say it's nothing to do with Islam and somehow it's all to do 
uh, it's all the fault of the West instead. Um, and uh, uh, the attacks on Jews, both in the diaspora and in Israel, is, of course, one of the biggest clues that it cannot be uh, the fault uh, of the West, um, uh, uh, that there is something else going on here. It is hatred of Jews, which is driving the attacks on Jews, which is why the attacks on Jews are so inconvenient, because they get in the way of the narrative. The narrative is we all know the reason why there's no peace in the world is the Israeli settlements. This theory is taking a bit of a bashing at the moment when the television news is full of Syria and Islamic State. But anyway, you get the general idea. The atrocities that we have seen in the last few months and recent years, um, unfortunately, they don't actually bring people to a more realistic understanding or analysis of what's happening. For sure, they shock everybody. Um, but if you look at the massacres in Paris, Charlie Hebdo, the attack on the, uh, on the magazine uh, Charlie Hebdo because it published uh, uh, cartoons uh, which were insulting to Muhammad and to Islam. And the same day there was the attack on the uh, uh, Ipa Caché kosher supermarket and the attempted attack on the Jewish school. Now, the massacre at Charlie Hebdo gave rise to claims that Charlie Hebdo was responsible for the attack. If it hadn't published the cart, it, it, because it published these cartoons, said CNN and many commentators, both in Britain and here, uh, because it published those cartoons, it was asking for it. It knew that what was going to happen. So, you know, it knew that it was going to be open to people trying to murder everybody in, in the magazine, and yet it went ahead and published a cartoon, so it's its fault. So, thank goodness, we can actually ignore the fact that it was Islamists that did it, or Muslim fanatics, it was, all, it was all the fault of the West again. So the narrative wasn't disturbed by Charlie Hebdo, but it was disturbed by the massacre at the kosher supermarket. And people couldn't deal with this. So it was reported, the massacre at the kosher supermarket was reported, it had to be reported because it was the same day. Uh, in Britain, virtually nobody reported the attack on the school. You could say, well, no one died in the attack on the school, but in my view, it's quite significant. Two attacks on Jewish targets, that actually should tell you something that's going on. And in the view of many French Jews, and I think they're absolutely correct, the only reason that the murders at the kosher supermarket were reported to the extent that they were was because they were on the coattails of Charlie Hebdo. If the murders had taken place only at the uh, Ipa Marché, uh, uh, at the Ipa Caché uh, supermarket, it would have caused virtually not a ripple. And we know that to be true because for the previous, whatever it was, 10 years, the French Jews have been under murderous attack and nobody in Britain has paid the slightest attention. No one. I don't think anyone reported in Britain, perhaps they did, but oh, so low key that I don't remember, the abduction, uh, torture, and murder of Ilan Alimi, uh, the Jewish boy who was uh, murdered. No one has reported. I mean, they, they report the sort of big atrocities, you know, but, but, but very little. And nobody is sort of saying, you know, taking to the street saying, je suis juif in the way they say, je suis Charlie. No one takes much notice. And the reason, in my view, is because it gets in the way of the story. You can't have Jews as victims. We all know that the Muslims are the victims. So it's like Jewish victims become kind of invisible, both in the diaspora and in Israel. Um, Now, as I was saying, I don't think this is simply a threat to Jews. It's the principal driver of the Islamist onslaught against the West. Uh, from the founder of modern radical Islamism, Said Qutb, through the writings of Osama bin Laden to the Hamas Charter, uh, Islamists contend that the Jews have created the evils to be eradicated, America, modernity, and the West. And yet, completely paralyzed by their phobia about Islamophobia, hung up by their obsession with Palestine, 
and twisted by Holocaust guilt into a profound reluctance to acknowledge Jewish victimization, Britain and Europe continue to fail to grasp that the fate of the Jews, both in Israel and the diaspora, is inextricably bound up with the fate of the West. So, you might think, what about British Jews? That beleaguered minority which can't be considered a minority. What do they think about all this? Surely they are very concerned about Muslim anti-Semitism. No. What do British Jews, in terms of their leadership, I don't talk about the Jew in the pew, the leadership, what do you think the leadership is most concerned to eradicate? Islamophobia. British Jews equate anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. The, I'm talking about the leadership, not talking about the ordinary Jews. The leaders of Jewish, the British Jewish community say they fight both equally. Equally. Why do they say this? Well, there are many reasons. First of all, they are very, very timid. British Jews are always very timid, and with good reason. Uh, their head, you know, heads below the parapet is the order, has been the order of the day, basically since Cromwell allowed the Jews back into Britain uh, in the uh, in the uh, 17th century. 18th century. Um, uh, they're timid. And they're very, very timid to defend Jews robustly because they believe that by talking about anti Semitism, you create anti Semitism. To the Jewish leadership, my crime in Britain, the Jewish leadership in Britain, my crime is that I create anti Semitism. I create it because I talk about it. If I didn't talk about it, there'd be less of it. That's the thinking. Don't upset the Gentiles. Don't insult them, because that just makes them hate us more. That's the order of the day. So there's a reluctance to talk about this at all. Um, the next thing is that uh, there are Jewish practices which are under attack in Britain and in Europe. Shechita and Brit Milah, Jewish ritual slaughter and circumcision. And, you know, Muslims also face a similar problem in terms of their ritual slaughter and their circumcision practices. And so the Jewish leadership has made common cause with Muslims to defend these practices and wants to continue to make common cause. And it thinks that by making common cause, they strengthen their own case. Now, I think for various reasons that is probably wrong. And I think that by associating with Muslim abattoir practices and Muslim circumcision practices, I think that the Jews of the Jewish leadership is in grave danger of turning Britain against Jewish ritual practices. But put that to one side. That is one very important reason why the Jewish leadership does not wish to uh, uh, talk about uh, Islamophobia and why it wants to make common cause so, you know, with its Muslim friends, uh, that we're all fighting the same bigotry together. The bigotry is the same. Now, the third reason, which is perhaps the most important and the most sensitive, is interfaith. Now, the Jews, the Jewish leadership believes with great faith in interfaith. <coughs> um, interfaith is the way in which we are going to make friends out of our enemies. Uh, we will sit down on interfaith committees and, you know, Jews, Christians and Muslims, and we will break down the barriers between us. We will find common ground on which we can agree, uh, where we can share things, we can find things that we think about each other that are wrong, and we will persuade, as Jews, we will persuade the Muslims that the things they've been taught since whenever about the Jews are wrong because they will see that they're wrong because we'll tell them and they can see that we're nice people and we extend the hand of friendship and so on, so on, so on. So this is a terrible mistake uh, because um, first of all, to keep the show on the road, it's a bit like the peace process, to keep the interfaith show on the road, you can't say anything that's going to upset somebody so badly they're going to walk out. You have to keep talking. So in order to keep talking, you kind of don't talk about anything that's really, really difficult. So that's the first problem. 
which is a kind of inherent problem. But then there's another problem. I mean, I, I, I've had this sort of conversation with rabbis who, have been, who are involved in interfaith work and who believe in it very sincerely, <coughs> and I, I sympathize with their motivation, um, and I think they are profoundly naive. This is how the conversation with them goes. Um, I will say uh, um, uh, e um, it's not possible to, um, to uh, connect uh, in the way that you think that you are connecting to these people on the interfaith committees, and to which the rabbis say, but we are, I know we are, uh, because I have made friends out of various imams and, and Muslim leaders, and I can see the change in their attitude, I can see the things that they are, they, they've been taught, I can see the, you know, the, the veils have been lifted from their eyes, and, and I, I, I can hear, they go on television sometimes, and they're saying the things that I've taught them to say. Uh, and I say, well, that's fantastic, that's wonderful. And how many people have you met on these committees? And they say, well, you know, 6, 12, 18. And I say, and how many Muslims are there in the world? And I say to them, do you think these Muslim leaders are going back to their communities in Britain saying, guess what, community? You know you think that the Jews are the spawn of the devil. They're actually really lovely people. Do you think they're saying that? Or do you think they're saying nothing? To which the answer is, well, that's not really my problem. Our, prob our, our whole thing is, is to make common cause and to, and, to, and to find common interests. And I say, but, but don't you realize where they're coming from theologically? To, and this is the real key. They say, the whole point of interfaith is that we don't get into theology at all, because we couldn't. We start from the premise on interfaith committees that I believe in this kind of stuff, and he believes in that kind of stuff, and I'm not going to try and convert him, and he's not going to try and convert me. We'll leave that to one side, because we'll never agree. And instead, we're going to concentrate on the stuff where we can agree. That's fantastic, isn't it? Heartwarming. And very sensible from a certain premise, which is that you're all on the same page, rationally speaking. That you're dealing with rational people who want to make common ground because they are prepared to meet you somewhere in the middle. But if you're dealing with a culture and a religion which starts on the premise that you are literally the devil's agents, there's not much room for the common ground. And the people who think there is are being used as patsies. They are being played for suckers. And that's exactly what the Jewish religious leaders and lay leaders who are in all this interfaith stuff are doing. But it drives everything before it. You can't speak against interfaith because then you become a really bad person because then you're into promoting conflict instead of dialogue and who wants to do that? So you can see how from a false premise you have a, an infrastructure which has been set up in the Jewish community leadership in Britain, and for all I know it's the same here, I'm, I just don't know about here, um, which uh, not only doesn't, doesn't, doesn't confront these terrible issues, but actually acts as a kind of uh, sanitizing mechanism for the prejudice and bigotry in the Muslim world to continue uh, with a kind of official stamp of approval. Look, I have Jewish friends. How dangerous is this? Uh, it's lethal. So this is why in Britain we have you know, the equation of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. This is why our chief rabbi, Ephraim Mervis, um, went, I think it was last year, November last year, uh, he went to, um, uh, I've forgotten quite where he went, he went to see the Syrian refugees in Greece, Somewhere like that. And listen to this. This is from the Jewish Chronicle. Quote, The chief rabbi and his party had been told it was wise to dress down in the camp. In the bus, they put on baseball caps to hide their kippot. Hide their kippot. Now just think about that for a minute. The kind of people they were seeing in the refugee camps were the kind of people who, faced with a kippah, wouldn't have been totally thrilled 
to put it no, wide, no more than that. Okay? Now, read on. Having put on his baseball cap to hide his kippah, Rabbi Mervis said, he could not help but draw comparisons to, quote, what as Jewish people we have seen before. He said, quote, I have been thinking about our past, our Jewish past and journey, and thinking about our sadness. Here, being taken into a tent where people are resting, I've been thinking about bunkers in Auschwitz, where there was a very different end. Thankfully, these people will have a happy end waiting for them. It will be of promise and hope. He added, standing here alongside these refugees, I'm enormously proud of the British Jewish community and the fact that we want to give. We are not asking questions. What is important is that they are humans, just like we are. They have babies, just like we do. And I'm proud of the way we have reached out, of them, out to them. Speaking to refugees has made me see the trauma people uh, has made me see the trauma people face could be eased if Europe would sufficiently invest in the hundreds of thousands who are in need. Now, given that the British government under David Cameron had set Britain's face against the European Union and had restricted the number of refugees to twenty thousand who the British would handpick in these camps to make sure that no jihadists came flooding into Britain. Can you imagine what the British Prime Minister felt when he heard and saw the British Chief Rabbi saying this? I am told that the British government finds the position of the British Jewish community leadership at present in respect of Islamic radicalization coming in through, uh, uh, well, Islamic radicalization in general distinctly unhelpful. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine this? The British government, not known for its enthusiasm to deal with anti-Semitism, finds the position of the British Jewish community leadership in respect of the equation between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia unhelpful? This is a truly astonishing situation. The now, assumption... Where was that? Hmm? Where was that? What? The Jewish Chronicle of November not, uh, last year. Okay. So the assumption among many diaspora Jews, especially uh, those on the left, is that anti-Semitism and thuggish political violence are to be found only among neo-Nazis or the far right. Uh, it's an article of faith that what is not left is right, what is right is evil, and so all that is not left is evil. That also explains the astounding comment which I personally heard in Jerusalem by Abe Foxman, who uh, recently retired as the head of the Anti-Defamation League, who told the Jerusalem conference that there was no anti-Semitism on the left in Europe, only on the far right. I, I would not have believed it had I said this, had I read this, I heard it. When? It was not a few months before he retired. Um, because you see, and, and how does he get to that, how does he get to that uh, view? Because he, he removes completely the issue of Israel. Remo com completely. So the issue of Israel doesn't, doesn't produce anti-Semitism, you see. It's only, you know, the Jews are sucking the blood of Christian children. That's anti-Semitism. That's on the far right. Okay, all right. It's not... That a common that you hear a leftist saying that, fine. Um, but by removing the issue of Israel, he was able to confirm himself in his belief that anti-Semitism anti is a right-wing neo-Nazi phenomenon. And a lot of Jews, diaspora Jews, believe that kind of instinctively to be true because they themselves are on the left. So they can't be, they can't be anti-Semitism on the left. How can they be? How could they support the left? if there was anti-Semitism embedded, embedded in the left. They couldn't do it. So it's always the right. So as a result of this mindset, neo-Nazis in Europe, real neo-Nazis, are conflated with democratic nationalists who simply want to stop the mass immigration which threatens the national identities and culture of the nations of Europe and European civilization. 
these nationalists are also deemed to be fascist. Now, this is complicated because some of these groups in Europe are neo-Nazi. They are fascist, but some are not. They're not. They're simply people who don't want Western European culture to be submerged and destroyed. And so the result is a re reckless absence of self-preservation by diaspora Jews in seeking to embrace those who would kill Jews or destroy Israel. Um, I would say in conclusion, um, what I've tried to illustrate to you is that um, the equation being made between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia is false, that it should concern us all, not simply because it denies or sanitizes or covers up uh, or ignores um, the victimization of Jewish people in Israel and the diaspora, but because it is my absolutely strongly held belief that until and unless the West joins up the dots and understands that anti-Semitism and the attacks on Jews in Europe and on Jews in Israel is not just some outbreak of a horrible prejudice that people thought was dead and buried with, in 1945 with the defeat of the Nazis in Europe. It is a fundamental aspect of the attack on the West and on Europe. On Europe. And until and unless the West realizes that anti-Semitism is driving the threat against itself, and that the charge of Islamophobia is a way of denying that essential truth, the West will not be able to defend itself properly. It will only defend itself properly when it joins up the dots and realizes that the attack on Jews in Israel and the diaspora is the attack on the West. It's not the canary in the mine. It is the attack. Uh, and until that is understood, we will not be able to defend ourselves properly. And uh, I just hope that uh, the, press, the, the press of events, which is changing people's minds, but slowly and in a confused fashion, uh, will enable us to join up the dots in this way. Thank you. Do you to take a quick break before Q&A? No, I'm happy to just proceed. Okay, so it's so officially Q&A. Um, okay, so this lady here will start, then you, and then... Okay, so absolutely. Melanie, just for some clarification, by the way, I have a question, but um, oh. Abe Foxman left Sorry. the ADL, and he's been replaced with someone who, in some ways, is even worse, someone who would work for oh, really? Obama. Oh, really? Yes. 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 And, yes. yes, and uh, green black. And also, it was interesting when you mentioned the attack at Hyper Cache and our own president when he referred to it, he did not say Jews. He said some folks in a deli. That was how yes, he... Yes, I remember that. That was the narrative. Sorry, sorry. Oh, it's my, fine, it's fine. My question to you is if you'd like to comment, I read something about there's a law in England where private religious institutions now have to teach an addition, a religion in addition to the one that is part of their institution, that Jewish schools have to select oh, teaching. Yes. A curriculum on Christianity or Islam, and they've selected Islam. Could you just comment on that, or, or give us some information on that? Yes, um, uh, there is a. Please repeat. Yeah. Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Ah. Um, uh, are uh, Jewish schools required to teach now an additional religion to Christian to <laughs> to Judaism? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes, and they are. And the chief rabbi has ordained that the religion that Jews should teach their children is the additional religion, is Islam. Any comments? I mean, what can you say? What can you say? Yes, so next and then. Thank you very much for this amazing professor. I have two questions. So the first one is I would like to hear your views on on how you think the American debate on anti-Semitism is how superficial it is. Because I think, in my opinion, as a European, as a French-Jewish man, 
Europeans, and especially the French, have come to a realization, which is, as you said, anti-Semitism is an attack on the West. And in a very sadly, in a very perverse way, what happened in Paris on November 13th, the French realized, 10 years ago, my French colleagues in government say, oh, like we basically, we, were not in, we don't feel really concerned. And they didn't say that, but that's what I felt. And they were sort of in denial, because they didn't see it coming. And where I'm not sure I agree is that I don't think they really did not care. I think it's just a huge natural human reaction to be in denial, because they don't want to realize that we're on the same boat and they're being attacked right now. And I think my opinion, and I would like to hear your views on that, is that America is in a very similar position. When my American fellow Jewish friends are telling me, oh, you guys in New York should all leave, but I feel like you're concerned. <laughs> this is happening to you too. I mean, a few weeks ago, you had an attack in California, and one talked about it because you don't want to face it. And the ISIS threat is extremely, extremely present in America, I feel, in my opinion. And a lot of, sadly, a lot of American Jews are very concerned with APAC and Tizani is like, oh, finding a legitimate, legitimating anti-Semitism is something new. No, it's not something new. Before it was the Jews hated the, uh, the Christian hated the Jews because we killed Jesus, because as you said, we created capitalism, because we, we also helped the development of communism. There's nothing new about that. And you feel, I feel, and sadly, that our American fellow Jewish people don't really realize that this is happening everywhere. It's a global problem. Yes, well, um, uh, I presume everyone heard the question, so, oh, should I repeat the question? Yes, um, <laughs> right. Um, the question is whether America uh, is sufficiently alert to uh, Muslim anti-Semitism, um, because it doesn't seem to be alert at all. And I would say that my view of America uh, is, first of all, partial and limited, because I've not studied it in detail. Um, but what I've seen over the, over, the, over the last few years coming here to talk and talking to two people and while I'm reading, obviously, is that um, America has looked with fascinated horror at what's been going on in Europe for a number of years and has been saying, you know, um, how are you dealing with your Muslim problem? Is it all over for Europe? Um, how can your culture survive? As if it's nothing whatsoever to do with America. Um, and it's not looking at what's happening in America at all. Um, uh, the situation is not the same. Um, in one crucial respect, there is well, one, one crucial difference in America and Europe, and particularly America and, and Britain. Um, Britain is the most post-religious country in the West. Uh, Europe is behind it, but is, you know, is motoring along in the same direction. Um, uh, America still has this tremendous bedrock of evangelical Christianity in the red states. I think that is also beginning to erode, but come, come to that in a minute. Um, but that makes a tremendous difference. America has had a culture, has, America is the site of culture war. There is a culture war between people who basically uphold Judeo-Christian morality and ethics and people who are trying to destroy it. Uh, your culture war uh, takes the form of alternative institutions to the, uh, those uh, dominated by the left, talk radio, Fox News, uh, the great, uh, some of the great uh, um, 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 uh, voluntary institutions, uh, which have grown up over, over, over the years. In Britain, we have nothing, nothing at all. Uh, we have one narrative, that's it. So that's the big difference, and that alternative discourse in America is driven by um, Christian belief, Christian believers. Now, um, this is all under tremendous attack. And in my view, the culture war, from the point of view of Judeo-Christian ethics, is being lost in America. Leave aside Muslims. I'm talking much more generally. Um, uh, um, and people don't, I think, appreciate that because of this tremendous bedrock of Christian believers, which still exists. But if you look at the universities, um, in terms of um, you know, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel activity, um, American universities are terrible. I mean, Britain's universities are dreadful. American universities are as bad, if not much worse. Uh, it was America, an American institution of great distinction, uh, which produced two scholars of great distinction, 
who produced um, the classic uh, anti-Jewish uh, tirade uh, uh, um, of the Jewish lobby, the Israel, the Israel lobby. Uh, it's not, that didn't come out of Europe, it came out of America. Um, Daniel Pipes has often said to me uh, in the past that there are a lot of physical attacks going on in America which are Muslim, they are Islamist, but they're not reported as such. So Americans by and large have no idea about the, the, the growing number of these attacks because they, they're not big enough and because for all the reasons that we know, they're, they're, not, they're not described in, the, in those terms. But even if you uh, put that to one side, um, uh, Muslim Brotherhood types are making, as far as I can see, enormous inroads into the American political establishment, especially in the last eight years, uh, but before that, but before that as well. So America has kind of looked to Europe in horror and not looked to itself because it's been lulled into a sense of false security by the fact that it has this tremendously strong Christian uh, uh, core. The Christian core itself is beginning to fray, even at the strongest part. And I know this, I say, I say this because I'm not just talking about, you know, the progressive Christian church, the Presbyterians and so on, um, who are like the Church of England, and they're, they're very, very hostile to Israel, uh, because they basically, in my view, it's because they deny the, the, the importance to themselves of Hebrew scripture. Um, so it's kind of theologically based. But what is very striking is that the evangelical movement, which has been in America, uh, you know, they are without doubt uh, Israel's strongest defenders in the whole of the Western world, far stronger than diaspora Jews, far stronger. However, in Jerusalem, every, it's not every year, I think, it's perhaps every two years or every three years, there is uh, a conference called Christ at the Checkpoint. Uh, Christ at the checkpoint teaches that Jesus was a Palestinian and the Palestinians are Jesus and the Palestinians are being crucified by the Jews all over again. The people who come to Christ at the checkpoint are overwhelmingly young American evangelical Christians. Now this is a sociological phenomenon I believe uh, without wishing to make what is clearly a complex situation over simple, it's been explained to me that this is uh, peer group pressure on young evangelical Christians means that they are horrified and ashamed by their parents. Um, their parents are, are, are widely regarded in the media, uh, in intellectual life in America as you know, knuckle-dragging troglodytes, as we can see from the fact they all oppose gay marriage. Right? That's become the kind of signature, <coughs> signature issue. And these young kids are horrified. They're embarrassed. They're embarrassed to be associated with this. Uh, they're Christian. They don't want to basically depart completely. How wonderful is it, therefore, that Jesus was a Palestinian? Because now they can support Jesus and support the Palestinians. And they can also support gay marriage because it's got nothing to do with that. So they become, they, they, they become believing Christians, believing that Jesus was a Palestinian, and that the Israelis are crucifying Jesus. And that's the way, in, that's, that's the way, that's the inroad that's being made there. And that's within the bedrock center of evangelical Christianity in America. So I wouldn't exaggerate that. I wouldn't exaggerate the numbers. Um, uh, you know, if you go, I'm sure, to the southern states, it's still, you know, very, very strong for Israel and for the Jews as the holy people who are, who are, you know, and, and all of that. But it's, even there, it's beginning to fray. So it's a long way round of saying that I think your, what lies behind your question is correct. I think America, for the reasons I've outlined, is behind Britain and Europe in this terrible trajectory. Um, uh, but it's coming along nicely behind us in the same direction, which is uh, something that Americans have yet to wake up to at all. Charles, um, so th thank you for your presentation. I have many questions, but I'll only ask a few. Thanks. I appreciate your insights. Ladder, please. 
the question, will, I guess, will be repeated. But um, so the question I have, can you speak of the origins of the term Islamophobia? Because Matthias Kunzel and others have written <coughs> that it was actually created by the Iranian revolutionary regime as a way to, as you said, to silence criticism of uh, Islamist thinking. And can you also comment on the fact that um, the P5 plus 1 has, through this uh, agreement over nuclear arms, have in a sense uh, transferred over $150 billion to a regime that owes its uh, intellectual heritage to the Sunni Muslim Brotherhood. That's where Ayatollah Khomeini um, got his inspiration about his perceptions of Jews and incorporating anti-Semitism into the regime's ideology. Can you comment on the impact that this money will have on supporting terrorism, but I think also supporting uh, anti-Semitism globally? Okay. Uh, do I know about the origins of Islamophobia coming from Iran? And will the money being freed up to go to the Iranian regime fuel further uh, Jew hatred? The discourse, the ideology. What? Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know about the origins of Islamophobia. I had no idea. I hadn't read what Matthias Kunzel had said about that. He may well be right. Um, what I do know is that Islamophobia is, like all these phobias, uh, imputes insanity to people who hold this view. So if you criticize Muslims, you are basically mad. A phobia is an irrational fear. It's not a prejudice. It's a fear. It's a, it's a, it's a form of, of, of um, mental derangement. So anybody who criticizes Islam is mentally deranged. That's the sting of it. Um, and it's a way of, you know, for that reason, it's a way of shutting down debate. It may well have been the Iranians. I just don't know. Will the money that uh, has come out of this ill-begotten, uh, mis misbegotten Iranian deal fund uh, further uh, terror and, um, I suppose, what you're saying is the, the, the promotion of the ideology that helps fuel the terror? For, for sure, for sure. I mean, that's... In, in, in some ways, I mean, I, I, I don't pretend to know in great detail uh, the machinations of the Iranian regime, but I just sort of wonder um, a bit, um, this whole sort of attempt by them to, 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 to get this deal through, given that, you know, you can basically get nuclear weapons off the shelf from you know people in Pakistan or wherever it is, and um, the North Koreans, um, it's it always seemed to me that quite apart from the like the honour of the regime in making their own weapons, okay, I take that point, but it always seemed to me that their sort of principal objective was the money, um, because you know their own economy is a basket case, um, and they need money uh, to fuel their terrible designs um, uh, to pay for the legions of terror producing persons around the world and export them around the world and the ideology is something that no one thinks about because I mean people know about Sunnis um, and they know about you know radical imams in Britain um, and radical mosques and the radical mosques are all Sunni aren't they well, actually, no. not, no. No. but nobody, but nobody even thinks about possibly there are Shia mosques that are a problem. No one. But they, I'm told they are there in great number, and they're there in Europe, and they're there for a reason. They're waiting. Um, you know, they're, they're sleepers. They're sleeper cells. Um, and they are planted all around Europe. They're Shia sleeper cells. They don't have to do anything, because the Sunnis are doing it all for them. But given a signal, they would be activated. So clearly, you know, this, this requires money. And it seems to me that one of the most pernicious parts of this deal is the fact that um, uh, this money is now being released. Um, I had a, a, a surreal conversation with somebody high up in the foreign establishment, foreign policy establishment in Britain. And I said, how can you have done this? You've released all this money. 
uh, to people who are going to now to export terror around the world to an enormously higher degree. And he said, no, that's not what's going to happen. It's all tied up already in debts to the Chinese. And I said, excuse me? He said they won't see a penny. This is the view of the Foreign Office in Britain. They won't see a penny. Yes. Yes. Oh, OK. Um, I have two questions. One, when I think of the BBC as an American, I think of Sherlock and Luther and a really bad Palestinian propaganda quotes news channel. But um, what I wanted to ask you is, what about freedom of the press? I mean, I'm used to America, where I can go on Facebook or YouTube or any place and find all the information that you say that is not available or that most Britons don't have access to. I mean, aren't there? Isn't there a Fox News? Aren't there um, independent okay. news agencies or news, news right. publications that do, you know, um, offer information about what is actually happening in? Israel or around the world. Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, is I got into a heated debate with a person from Israel on Facebook. And he, as soon as Brussels happened, he came out with this big statement, Jews, get out of Europe. And so I said, no, you're wrong. I said, what needs to happen is the police, counterterrorism, and the government need to wake up and do their jobs. I said, I am not ready to surrender the history of Western civilization, Western culture, and Western art to be completely destroyed and eradicated from the face of the earth. I'm not willing to stand by and let that happen, and I don't think it's necessary. So I said, so telling all Jews, I said, that would be a huge financial, cultural, and spiritual loss for Europe if all Jews did, quotes, get out of Europe. So, and where would they go? Well, Australia, Israel, and America. So what's the question? So my question to you is, do you think I'm right? Or do you, what is, well, how do you foresee okay. the future here? Do you think I, I was right? Or do you think there is some validity to what he's saying? So there are two questions. Uh, the first is, um, uh, doesn't Britain have a, plural, a plurality of media so that uh, people are being told uh, essential facts about um, all these matters? And the second question is, um, uh, should Jews feel they should leave Britain and Europe, or should they stay and fight for Western civilization? Um, so on the first question, I'm afraid to say that there is no plurality in Britain's media. Is that because it's state? I know no, state there's no... Is state uh, this is, it's, a, it's a long and tedious and complicated um, discussion. Mm -hmm. But um, when I say there's no plurality, what I mean is this, that there are right-wing newspapers <coughs> and left-wing newspapers. That is true. But they all tell lies about Israel. Oh, okay. um, some of them tell fewer lies than others. Okay. Um, but... Um, uh, the real problem, I think, is not newspapers, where there is a, there are there are there are there are shades of, of of political opinion. The real problem is the dominance of the BBC, um, which is unique in the world because of its um, uh, range and the fact that it is um, uh, it is a kind of kite. But the BBC is a kind of kite mark of objectivity and truth, and is believed. Therefore, people don't believe what they read in newspapers. So, in a way, you know, there's not such a problem. Uh, they dis you know, people discount what they believe in newspapers to a large extent. But people don't discount what they hear or see on the BBC. It's regarded as, you know, it's the truth. And this is the problem because it's not the truth. Uh, the BBC sees the entire world through a left-wing prism. Right. And there are many complaints about this, but then no one get they, they don't get anywhere. Now, there is no Fox News in Britain, largely because of Britain's um, regulatory uh, system, broadcasting regulatory system, which insists on, I've forgotten what the term is that you have here, um, but it's, it's, it's um, the perception of fairness. Um, is the fairness doctrine, is, yes. it, is that what it's called? Right, so 
that means you can't have a Fox News because it's not fair, right? The BBC is fair because it's balanced, okay? <laughs> Hence the problem, it's a circular problem. The BBC is not balanced, but we can't say that because we know, because it is balanced. So when you say to BBC people, you're not balanced, they get very upset because what they're about is balance. And because they have a mindset which is the wrong mindset, which is a, a liberal left-wing perspective, they simply cannot see they're not balanced. So we go around in a complete circle. So it's like a closed thought system. So it's not state-run. It's, it's funded by the license fee. British people who own a television set have to pay a fee, which is called the license fee. Their, their television is licensed. So it's funded by the people. It's not funded by the state. It's a very common misconception. The BBC is funded by the state. It's not. It's much worse. It's, mm. it's, it's controlled by the intelligentsia. It's much worse than being controlled by the state. But anyway, um, in fact, I, I'm being a bit flippant because state control is no good at all. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a more subtle uh, situation with the BBC. So there's no Fox News. Um, uh, there is no alternative broadcasting voice. And that is essential, an essential part of the problem. Um, the uh, question of whether Jews should leave Europe. Look, uh, I spend much of my life now in Israel because I feel safer there. Um, I feel safer at the epicenter of the Third World War than I do in London. And I'm not talking about physical safety. I'm not talking about physical safety. I'm talking about, you know, being in a country which is where the Jews are not on their knees, A, and B, where people are fighting for the survival of what we consider to be Western civilization. They're fighting. They identify the enemy. They take the appropriate measures. They don't always work, clearly, but they are geared to the fight. They understand there is a war. And in Britain, there is no understanding. Um, and in America, there's no understanding. So, uh, for these and other reasons, and also, you know, I, it, it's a, a, tr a tragic situation where somebody who is a British Jew who defends Israel is considered to be a traitor to her country. I can't have that. Um, so, there's a complicated set of reasons. But, um, so, I'm somebody who's kind of made that choice. And, you know, I have grandchildren in Britain, and I'm fearful. And a lot of British Jews are fearful for their grandchildren in Britain. Now, having said that... Fearful for their spiritual no, well-being? No, physical safety. Physical safety. Um, what's going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen, but it ain't going to be pretty. Either way, either Britain and European societies say, you know what, Europe was a great idea. Enlightenment was fantastic. Modernity, terrific. Science, wonderful. Shame, it's all over. And just get on and buckle down, it's possible. Possible, or they're gonna fight. Now if they fight, they may win, but it's gonna be bloody, It'll be bloody either way. And the Jews are gonna be right in the center. They're gonna get it from all sides. That's what I fear. It's increasing social disorder, increasing social disorder. I don't know whether Britain and Europe are going to fight to defend the West, as you correctly say, these uh, values and civilization of inestimable value and worth. I don't know whether they're going to fight to defend them. Nobody can say that. Um, but whether or not they do, it's not going to be pretty. Um, now, whether Jews should leave, I wouldn't dream of telling Jews to leave or to stay. Will they leave? Well, a lot in France have left um, uh, because the level of violence in France, I mean, we have a, somebody who knows much more about this than I do, but it would seem to me the level of violence against Jews in France reached, so has re reached such a level it became intolerable for a lot of Jews to, to stay there. I have to say a lot of French Jews have gone to London, <laughs> um, <laughs> fleeing, I think, the tax situation in France rather than Muslim violence, but anyway. Um, uh, other countries are much more sluggish. It depends on the country. British Jews, you have to drag them out. 
the level of, of pain would have to increase exponentially before they will ever move. Um, it's perfectly possible nowadays to be a British Jew and not see there's a problem at all. Um, you don't get molested. Uh, if you live in a certain kind of way, if you're the kind of Jew particularly who either tunes out anything to do with Israel or actually agrees with quite a lot of what is said about Israel being a fascist and apartheid state, and there are a lot of British Jews who think that, um, then you, you, you don't have a problem. You still have nice friends, nice dinner parties in fashionable parts of London. You don't wear a kippah, so you can't get knocked off. Um, you have nice job, professional advancement. What's not to like? What's not to like? You can live like that very happily. So the level of pain in Britain for Jews is n simply not in the same league as it is in France. So everyone is in a different, a different boat. Um, uh, if you look at the sort of long-term prospects for Europe, um, uh, will it survive as a Western civilization? Uh, I, again, I couldn't possibly, I couldn't possibly say. Um, but there are signs that there are people who are, you know, beginning to put two and two together and are prepared to make a stand and make a fight. And there are other people who are, you know, going to fight them. So it's a, it's going to become messy, confused bloody and just very, very frightening and difficult. And that's just the optimistic view. Yes. Thank you so much. This was absolutely brilliant. What can we do about it to combat it? Okay. What can we do to combat these um, disturbing uh, trends uh, which are being uh, well, the, the, the disturbing trend that we need to combat is, is, is the fact that the disturbing trends are being ignored and sanitized. Um, as ordinary people, it's always difficult to say what we can do. Um, but we have to just keep talking and um, uh, activating. But I think more sensibly than we have been perhaps collectively doing in the past. Because um, we have to identify... Uh, more clearly what we're actually up against. Uh, for the reasons that we've been talking about, few people are prepared to talk about you know, these, the, these particular issues. Um, uh, it will be very helpful for uh, much more discussion to take place about um, what the Palestinians actually say about Jews um, and about Israel and the way they teach their children to hate and all, all that sort of stuff. I mean, it is said, but it doesn't really get much traction. Um, it would be uh, helpful, uh, to put it mildly, for people to know all these, you know, to, 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 to join up the dots in the way that I've been, I've been des des describing. Um, and uh, uh, to, uh, to basically face down the accusations of Islamophobia and political correctness and all that sort of stuff, which uh, just strangle um, uh, uh, proper discussion about these issues. Um, uh, so much of it is, while people make important points, it's sort of tangential in a way. Um, uh, much depends also on, I don't wish to be personal, but you know the role of America is really crucial. And in the last uh, eight years, we have seen a retreat of America from the global stage, a retreat from America's historic conception of itself as the exceptional nation, which will, which is, you know, which upholds peace and, which, which upholds democracy and freedom in the Western world. Now, I'm looking at, you know, your coming election. I'm, uh, what can one say? What can one say? We're at a pivotal moment for the world. America is desperately needed. What's desperately needed is for America to recover its sense of that mission. Um, if America elects a president who will, who sees that, then a lot of things will change for the better. A lot of things will change for the better. 
Um, but I don't know. I mean, I you know, you know about this m much better than I. I'm looking at it from you know a long way away, and I'm just wondering. Um, I'm wondering whether. Uh, at the end of you know, at the end of the presidential process, um, we're going to have a president. You're going to have a president which will who will who will do that. So, I don't wish to throw the question back at America, but you say what can we do? Uh, elect a president who gets it. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I have uh, two points. First, I did a study of Christianity. There's a specific. Theological issue regarding Christian support of Israel. There are Christians who are called um, dispensationalists, and there are those who follow what's called covenant theology. Now, covenant theology has always been anti-Israel because it doesn't believe the Jews have a right to a state. It's, this, it's the dispensationalists who do, and they're the ones who are the evangelicals so far. The problem is that all the schools now in America, like Bob Jones and all the other schools that where uh, trained the, di the dispensationalist preachers are now being changed into covenant schools. All the younger teachers and all the younger students. So in about 20 years or so, the evangelical support just won't be there. And you can see it now in the whole theological shape. That's number one. The second thing I wanted to say is, um, in addition to everything you said about why people don't like to talk about anti-Semitism, I think there's a, there's a further reason, which is people don't even know what anti-Semitism is. They see it as a sort of like the Jewish version of racism, and it's not. It That's has right. different features to it. And I've rarely found Jews who actually understand. And without making a whole speech myself, I just want to recommend uh, Daniel Goldhagen's new book, um, The Devil That Never Dies, because he makes the point that anti-Semitism anti really is about the idea that Jews are evil. Once you understand that one concept, everything else falls into place. So that, for example, why is anti-Zionism, anti-Semitic, because it's fundamentally a fear of Jewish power. And once you get that idea, see, all these racial ideas are all about power. And so Islamophobia is about supporting Islamic power, and anti-Zionism anti is about the fear of Jewish power. So, you know, it's like the idea that, okay, we can, we can tolerate Jews as long as they don't have any power. So that's why they think they're not being anti-Semitic. It's their idea that Jewish power is a danger and an evil and a darkness, that that's why they're against it. So okay, so there are two points here. One is that there is a, um, a, a, a very worrying development in uh, Christian uh, theological teaching here in America, uh, in that um, the uh, dispensationalists' uh, view, view of, um, uh, of Christianity um, is being replaced by the covenantal, covenantal view. And the dispensationists are basically pro-Israel, and the covenantal view is basically anti-Israel. And the, the covenantal view is now taking over so that young theologians are, becoming, are going to become uh, much more anti-Israel, and the evangelical base for Israel support will, dis will disappear. And uh, the uh, second point was the unique nature of anti-Semitism is not understood. It's regarded as simply a Jewish prejudice, uh, but people don't understand that the essence of anti-Semitism is the view of Jewish power and the Jew that the Jews are evil. I entirely agree with both of those points. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of the, issue, the specific issue of American theological colleges, but I can, I can believe that to be, to be the, the case. Um, I, I don't quite understand why the dispensationalist view is being eclipsed by the covenantal view. Um, I don't really understand why the evangelicals have split in that way. Um, in Britain, uh, this split was first noticed um, just a few years ago, um, and it was considered uh, by people who were concerned about the state of the 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 um, the, um, uh, the security and defence of Israel. Uh, people were horrified by this inroad into evangelicalism. I agree it's an extremely worrying uh, uh, problem, but I think that more generally, uh, Christianity quite clearly has a problem in that Christianity is being eclipsed by secularism. Um, and I think part, I mean, this is obviously a very complicated uh, discussion, which we don't have time to go into, but uh, I've heard people who are Christian Zionists 
who still remain Christian Zionists, say something which I believe to be true, that without Judaism, Christianity is meaningless. And because Christianity, where, Christ, where, where the Christian church has repudiated its Jewish roots, it's dying, which is why the Church of England is dying. And unless and until Christianity reconnects itself to its Jewish roots, it will die. And I believe that to be true. When I talk about joining up the dots, that's, one of the, that's, that's some of the dots that have got to be joined up. But the Christian church has got to understand, once again, that it is nothing without the Hebrew Bible and, that, and its Jewish roots. And if it rediscovers its Jewish roots, then you know, Europe will be saved. If it doesn't, it won't. Um, so the two are connected. Um, the second point about anti-Semitism, I think, is absolutely correct. Anti-Semitism is considered to be a prejudice like any other. It's just the Jewish prejudice. That's why it's equated with Islamophobia. Leave aside the difficulties with Islamophobia as a concept. You know, Jewish, anti-Jewish feeling is like anti-Islamic feeling, is like anti-Hindu feeling, is like anti-black feeling. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's not to that's not to say for a moment that bigotry in general is bad. It's always bad, but it's not just bigotry. It is a particular view. It has unique characteristics of the Jews as a cosmic evil. Indeed, a cosmic evil, like a supernatural evil. Um, it is a view of the Jew as the devil. And that view is held even by secular people who don't believe in the God or the devil at all. Um, but they nevertheless invest Jews with this kind of cosmic, demonic characteristic. And that is the characteristic of classic Jew hatred down through the centuries. And it is, by an amazing coincidence, the characteristic of anti-Israel feeling, um, that Israel is held to be responsible for the fact that there is no peace in the world. Um, uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, for whom I hold no brief whatsoever, um, is a demonic figure. Uh, he alone is responsible for the fact that there is no peace in the Middle East. And this is insane. It's completely insane. Um, so how does one explain this derangement? It is a unique derangement. I'm not aware of any other prejudice, however bad a bigotry and prejudice is, that is deranged in this way. And it is unique to the Jews. And it's unique to the prejudice against Israel. And by, I say, by an amazing coincidence. They happen to be exactly the same characteristic. Um, so. I agree with you. I'm not quite sure where that gets us. Um, but it's important, in my view, uh, as I'm sure it is in yours, that we understand what we're up against um, in terms of the nature of people denying what there is, what, what is out there, in order that we can ever confront it. Mila? Yep. Oh. I just was thinking about all the things you said, and I was thinking about the moderate Muslims, you know, 1.6 billion Muslims, 20% of our world is comprised of Muslims. Do you not feel that if there were a portion of the, the moderate Muslims who would take a stand, not necessarily against anti-Semitism, however, against their own, the, 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 the jihadists, if they finally took a stand and say, hey, you're killing us too. They're killing their own. They don't care who they kill. They want to kill everybody. Not just about anti-Semitism, although that's a great part, and it is the root cause. I agree with that. But if the, if, so I don't know if this is really a question or just if you agree with what I'm saying, that if the, if the moderate Muslims took a stand, it would help. The question is uh, against terrorism. The question is, uh, if moderate Muslims took a stand, would it help? Uh, it's absolutely essential. Um, uh, it would help enormously. Um, there are uh, Muslim reformers. Um, there are more Muslim reformers than we know of because if you're a Muslim reformer, you literally take your life in your hands. Uh, but there nevertheless are Muslim reformers who understand that there is a problem with their religion, um, well, that it lends itself... There were two Egyptian uh, television newscasters that in the past couple of weeks that landed on Facebook that absolutely spoke out. Right. It's, it's amazing. They're still alive. No, but they don't have jobs anymore. I believe, I, I, I mean, I think that, you know, 9-11 um, uh, was a shock in the Muslim world, um, and a lot of Muslims started to think. Um, they didn't speak up, uh, but they started to think. 
and that has accelerated as atrocity has followed atrocity, not least because they can see that Muslims are killing and slaughtering Muslims. So the old excuses, uh, the old, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the alibis uh, that, was, that have been used by the Muslim, the tyrannical Muslim regimes, that it's the Jews that are the problem, clearly won't wash. Uh, because Syria, uh, uh, etc., uh, Islamic State, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I believe that um, it's terribly important for the West to support Muslim reformers. I believe that we should, in the West, treat Muslim reformers rather like we treated Soviet dissidents under the, in, in the Soviet Union. Uh, we had a very a particular policy towards dis dissidents in the Soviet Union. We understood that they were in great danger, and we understood they were very important. And we understood that it was very important that we supported them. So we named them, we identified who they were, we said what was happening to them, we had marches, we had rallies, we had uh, protests. Uh, we kept, we had their, we put their names and their identities and what they were doing into the public domain in order to show the Soviet Union that we were supporting them and that gave the dissidents themselves hope and it, it engendered more people behind them and so on and so forth. We haven't done that at all with Muslim reformers. Indeed, the politicians from Obama through Cameron, sometimes, because he changes sometimes to a more sensible position, but anyway, uh, Hollande, when they all say Daesh, Islamic State, has got nothing to do with Islam, that Islamic terrorism has got nothing to do with Islam, that it's anti-Islamic and all this rubbish. What they're actually saying is that there is no point in Muslim reform. There is no need to reform Islam because there's no problem with Islam because it's nothing to do with Islam. In other words, every time they say it's nothing to do with Islam, not only is it ridiculous, but it knocks the ground from under the feet of these immensely courageous Muslim reformers. Um, and we should be doing the opposite. We should be saying these reformers are really important because the only way as a world we're going to emerge from this nightmare is if Islam reforms itself. Not for us to say whether it can or can't, but there are people who think it can, that's good enough for us. Let us give them all help and support and encouragement. We should be saying that. Why don't we say that? Because that would be to admit there is something wrong with the religion. And we, for all the reasons that we've been talking about this evening, um, our leaders are not prepared to say that. And so our leaders are consigning these immensely brave Muslim reformers uh, to virtual insignificance. They are undermining them uh, with every statement of this kind. Um, and I think this is really wicked stuff uh, because I don't know whether it's possible to reform Islam. I have no idea. But I do think that if we were all sitting here in, I don't know, the... the 13th or 14th century, we would all be saying, you know, this Christianity is really, you know, just appalling, um, and there is no way theologically you can ever get, get any better. Um, but it did. It reformed itself. Who would have thought it? I don't know whether Islam can reform itself, but there are certainly Muslims who do think that, and we should be giving them every support. No, I think there's mm -hmm. sure. two newscasters, both of them, one was a, a woman and the other one was a man, I think they were both Egyptian. And both of them went, have you ever seen a Jew cut off somebody's hands or their head just wow. because it, it was it was absolutely a watershed moment. To me, it was an absolute I've lived all of these books. Also, as, a, as our point of information, CC went to Al-Azhar University. I was going to say, I was going to say. I was going to say, President Sisi went to Al-Azhar, which is, you know, the nearest thing that Islam has to um, a kind of theological college. Al-Azhar University, and to, a, to a, 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 an audience of imams with stony faces and folded arms, he said the religion has to reform itself. We cannot have a situation where 1.6 billion Muslims wish to murder the rest of the world. We have to reform. In Britain, that speech is unknown, not reported. Yes, not reported. Mr. Sidi. Thank you. Um, Melody, this past Shabbat at the Spanish-Portuguese synagogue, uh, your chief rabbi, Mervis, uh, attended a luncheon, and it, he was supposed to speak about the future of European Jewry. But instead, he spoke about how Europe needs to 
open its arms to the refugees and how it's our obligation to welcome the refugees to Europe. So I wanted to say that your talk tonight is right on point, and I want to have another comment, and like you and Jeff would say about it. Um, right now, off-Broadway, there's a, a, a play, and since you're in New York, you may want to see it. Nathan the Wise is set in Jerusalem between the end of the Third Crusade, 1192, and the death of the great Sultan Saladin, 1193, period. Just prior to this time, a Palestinian geographer named Mukadasi described Jerusalem as the most beautiful city. City. So I googled Mukadasi, and nowhere does it say he's Palestinian. It's 1192. <laughs> it refers to him as an Arabic uh, 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 his, uh, geographer. And, and, he, so, and did he actually think that Jerusalem, with the sewage running down the street in 1192, was beautiful? This is. So he, he wasn't, he, he obviously, yeah. this, so this is right on the point as to what yeah. you're saying, and I have brought the brochure for you in case you do have time oh, thank while you. you're in New York to, to see the play. And, thank you. And it was about, uh, the wind-up is uh, how all the religions are basically, as you mentioned, some kind of equal somehow. Okay. I'm not sure that, that requires an answer. Do you, but I, I take your point. Thank you. So, Miss, you have the final question. You've been waiting patiently. Uh, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for blowing the whistle on this more than a decade ago. Uh, you, you changed and opened a lot of doors to a lot of minds, so I, I'm personally grateful for that. Um, we consistently deal with these issues in the same way that Harry Potter dealt with he who can't be named. Um, we, we don't use the language, and facts do not sway real Jew hatred. I mean, it doesn't matter what you throw at them. So it, when, you, when you take a step back, you're, you're speaking to people constantly. Is there anything that can be said to sway people who won't be swayed? Are we, or are we destined to be this out, outside, this outcast, because I had my own experiences Princeton that I'll share with you, privately not, yeah. Given uh, the uh, nature of Jew hatred, uh, is there anything that can be done to persuade people who subscribe to it um, that uh, they shouldn't? <laughs> um, I think there are two aspects to Jew hatred which need to be disentangled. One is the people and one is the thing. Um, in Britain, I can only really talk about Britain because that's what I know, but in Britain there are a lot of very decent people who subscribe to obnoxious ideas about Israel which have the same characteristics as classic Jew hatred. In other words, identifying Israel um, falsely as the uh, source of all bad things in the world, the obsessional nature of of that of that uh, of that uh, view, um, blaming Israel for crimes of which it is not only innocent but it's in fact the victim, and so on. Now, I think those characteristics, which are unique to Jew hatred, uh, make the anti-Israel discourse a form of Jew hatred. It's not simply criticism of Israel. It's it is something which is demonic. It's it's, it's a demonization which is fundamentally irrational. Now, a lot of people in Britain subscribe to those views, but they are decent people. They don't actually hate Jews at all. Um, uh, they uh, have nothing against Jews, particularly, and they would be horrified at the thought of being prejudiced against anybody. But they subscribe to these views because they genuinely believe that Israel is the rogue state. They genuinely believe that Israel is in illegal occupation and is building illegal settlements. They genuinely believe that Israel is acting in an oppressive manner, to put it mildly, against Palestinians. They genuinely believe that Palestinian Muslims have been in Palestine since time immemorial, that they are the indigenous people of the land, and so on and so on. In other words, they subscribe to a set of lies 
These lies have been promulgated in order to destroy the Jewish state. They don't know that. They don't know that. So, there are people who actually are possessed of an animus against Jews and an animus against Israel, which cannot be persuaded, they cannot be persuaded about. They cannot be persuaded about the facts because, for various reasons, their whole moral and political personality is tied up in believing this set of untruths. And you can't do anything with them in terms of persuading them. I'll come back to them in a minute, because you can do something with them. But you can't persuade them of the truth. Because if I tell them these are the facts of history, in 1920 this was the agreement entered into by the world in respect of the Jews, they will say, this is your truth, this is your fact. It's just your opinion because you're a Zionist Jew. So that's the end of the discussion. So we can't persuade those people about facts. There are many more people who subscribe to these lies who just don't know the truth. And if you say to them, you do know that the Jews are the only people as a people for whom the state of Israel or the kingdom of Israel was ever their national kingdom, their national homeland, you do know that, they will say, what are you talking about? They have no idea. So those people can be persuaded by facts. They just don't know them. Now, the people who can't be persuaded by facts, there is another set of weapons that can be used against them. One has to understand that those people who I would call, for the sake of brevity, the left-wing intelligentsia, are apparently motivated by a concern for the oppressed of the world, of whom the Palestinians are axiomatically members. But they're not. They don't cons they're not concerned about the fate of the Palestinians at all. The fact that the Palestinians are being murdered and jailed and oppressed in great number by other Palestinians doesn't concern them in the slightest. They're not concerned about Palestinians. They're concerned that they are seen to be concerned about Palestinians. Because what drives this kind of person is narcissism. It is the image that they have to others, that they present to others, and to themselves as people who are concerned about the fate of the oppressed, people who are compassionate, people who are nice, people who are devoid of prejudice, people who wish only for good. That's their view of themselves, and that's where they are vulnerable. Because what you have to do with them is to hold their feet to the fire. You have to basically show them and the world that they subscribe to the very things that they hate. So they are racists. They believe in ethnic cleansing. They believe everybody who thinks that there cannot be a state of Palestine while the settlers are there is a believer in racist ethnic cleansing. They believe that there cannot be a state of Palestine with any Jew in it. That's what it means when it says you cannot have a state of Palestine while the settlers are there. That's what it means. And when you say that to them, the reaction is very interesting. They are bewildered, they are appalled, they deny it, but they can't get out of it. Because it's true. That's what they're supporting. That is the logic of their position. It's what they themselves say, but they don't understand that they are supporting ethnic cleansing because they don't think of it in those terms. All one has to do is tell them that. And I can tell you, on a one-to-one -one basis, the effect is electric. Electric. If our leaders were to say this, if people who believe that the settlers are the problem are believers in racist ethnic cleansing of Jews from Palestine, what do you think the reaction would be? Uproar? But basically, if would you go, what? You know it's true. How dare you? Quite easy. It's quite easy. So there are weapons one can use against the people whose minds are sealed. The weapon is not rationality, because they are beyond that. The weapon is humiliation. You take them down. You take them down. You destroy their reputations to themselves and to others. And it's a fearsome weapon because their reputation is everything to them. Everything. And it's never used. 
for all kinds of obvious reasons, it's never used. So there are things we could do. There are things we can do. It's not a hopeless situation by any means, even though one is dealing with fundamentally an irrational mentality. Well, so then, on behalf of East Gap and this wonderful audience, thank you.